reckoning and dismissal. Thus said the Lord God, I'm going to deal with the shepherds. I will demand a reckoning of them for my flock, and I will dismiss them from tending the flock. Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 10. Then I will appoint a single shepherd over them to tend them, my servant David. He shall tend them. He shall be a shepherd to them. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be a ruler among them. I am the Lord, and I have spoken. And I will grant them a covenant of friendship. That's Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 23 through 25. My servant David shall be king over them, be one shepherd for all of them. They shall follow my rules and faithfully obey my laws. Thus they shall remain in the land which I gave to them, gave to my servant Jacob, and in which your fathers dwelt. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever with my servant David as their prince for all time. Uh, chapter, Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 24 through 25. These verses were written with reference to God's servant David of a time in the lands of Abraham that kingdoms existed. Even using the names kings and prince today would only be relevant to those who practice Judaism faithfully, following God's laws, and remaining in the land and dwelling there forever. This is the flock. The Jewish people who practice Judaism and he fear and revere God. This is not an anointment to be king over the lands of Abraham and its people. And God's servant David will come in a time that Israel is a democratic state. In today's world, with so many synagogues and people of Israel, the best interpretation is that David will be a leader of God's flock to tend them and be a ruler among them. David is not a king or a prince of Israel, and there is no mention of a kingdom as commonly believed from the teachings of the sages and the rabbis of the ancient and middle ages and today. When the anointed one comes, the Lord says he will deal with and demand a reckoning from the rabbis and dismiss them from tending the flock. Then he will appoint a single shepherd to tend them, his servant David. He shall tend them. He shall be a shepherd to them. The Lord will be their God, and his servant David shall be a ruler among them. God does not appear to be pleased with the teachings of the rabbis of the day of the Lord and their reliance on the opinions and commentaries of the sages and rabbis from the ancient age and middle ages who often disagreed with one another. There are many inconsistencies and errors in what the sages and rabbis say and what the scripture says. On many occasions, the sages and rabbis, and most notably Rembam, have taken from and added to the scripture. God says the anointed one is a shepherd, king and prince of the flock, a ruler among them not of the promised lands and all its people, and perfecting the world. Rambam removes God's word and replaces it with Rambam's word. But the anointing one is a king of the lands and will gather a kingdom unto him. The commandment by God that nothing is to be taken from or added to his teachings and laws of the Torah applies to all the Hebrew Bible all of which was written at his direction and command, and all of which is God's word. The entire teaching of the era of redemption, restoration, and exaltation, the Messianic era, 
beginning with the arrival of Mushiach, the anointed one, the descendant of David, described in Isaiah 53. Stray so far from the natural order of the world and the ways of God and his words written by his prophets that it angers him. The prophets were rarely listened to and God spoke directly to them, the prophets, telling them what to write. That is one reason he will have a reckoning with them and dismiss them. The sages and rabbis are men interpreting and teaching that in the day of the Lord, King Moshiach will perfect the world. The world speaking Hebrew, practicing Judaism, recognizing the Jews have been corrected by God all along, is what the flock wants to hear and brings donations to the shepherds. Interpreting and teaching what God actually says will not bring many donations for the reasons that the flock will want to know. Why is God going to have a reckoning with you and dismiss you? They would ask their rabbis. They will want to know what the sages and rabbis have done to anger God. God is not creating a new world of all men loving and exalting and holding in high esteem the Jewish people and practicing Judaism, though he is creating a new heaven for only the Jewish people with the name Israel shall endure. God has never changed the will of men or how they think of him and the Jewish people in his power. In the exaltation the Jewish people receive from the world will come through the efforts of God's righteous servant, the shepherd David, as directed and commanded by God as he did with Moses. Two billion or so Christians are not going to wake up one day and in one accord denounce Jesus as a false god and convert to Judaism. This is true for the Muslims too. No man is going to convince the followers of Islam that he is the last prophet of God and that it is not Muhammad as etched in stone on their mosque. Two billion Muslims are not going to wake up on the same day as the Christians and denounce Allah as they know him and convert to Judaism. Hezbollah, Hamas, the leaders of Iran, ISIS, and the other terrorist group would more likely announce a jihad against God's righteous servant than they would acknowledge that the Jewish people had been right about God all along. The real world is not the confines of a synagogue, a yeshiva, or religious library. Rabbis need to step out and consider their beliefs in a world of education, science, and technology that did not exist in the days of the Bible, the days of the sages, and through the Middle Ages. God's words had to be understood by an illiterate and civilized people from the teachings of intelligent men in a world where meat was eaten and cooked and babies were sacrificed to gods in the biblical days. His book was written for different ears, eras, <laughs> ears, eras, and people. The people of the ancient age and the middle ages, and the people of the age of enlightenment and reasoning through the age of information today. <coughs> Excuse me. God's reckoning with the rabbis today and their dismissal from tending the flock cannot happen in the real world today. There are far too many synagogues and Jewish people and rabbis practicing Judaism. It was something that could be believed in the ancient age and the Middle Ages. The rabbis today base their interpretation of the scripture on a world that no longer exists a world of the sages and rabbis in the ancient and middle ages and not this world. They do not teach of the reckoning God will have with them and their dismissal that leaves no room 
for special circumstances. The belief that David will have all of Israel practicing Judaism and perfecting the world with everyone speaking Hebrew will not happen. If God was going to make that happen in his power, he would have written it that way. God says in Malachi 3 that many will heed and revere him and be written into the scroll of remembrance, and many will not. He says this with the arrival of the angel of the covenant with sin forgiveness at hand. That's the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. The covenant which says that his forgiveness of sin will cause Torah to be written on every heart and all will heed him. The scripture of God is written by his prophets at his command and direction with multiple purposes as well as for prophecy. It must be interpreted with the world of the prophet, the world of the sages and rabbis, and the world of the day of the Lord in mind. All rabbis are dismissed when the anointed one who God calls David arrives. Not from their synagogues and constituents, as that is not possible. God knew that would be the case when he had it written by Ezekiel. They are dismissed in the eyes of God. The rabbis will not be in right standing with God, even though they are sin-free. And God remembers their sins no more. And that they practice, are very observant Jews and practice Judaism perfectly. They're still not in right standing because he dismissed them. In Malachi 3, they join those in Malachi 3 who do not heed and fear him, even though they do. That's who they join. Those that he doesn't pay any attention to, as though they were not there. They are not in right standing with him and will not be entered into the scroll of remembrance. This is Malachi 3. God has always accepted repentance and been forgiving if the repentance is heartfelt. The wrong is not repeated and restitution is made to the person or entity wrong. For the rabbis, repentance is telling their flocks of the false teachings that have evolved from the ancient times that have continued today. Restitution is teaching the true words of God of the day of the Lord. As God dictated the Torah to Moses, God dictated to me an unpublished book entitled Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord. I am Moshiach. The Spirit of God alighted upon and entered me, and God was in His Spirit. Now, I have about 25 videos out there. You can find out what that means, and it's all backed up with the Scripture. They're going to have to teach what's in that book. It's God's teachings. It's not mine. He gave it. He, he, he taught it to me. I was an atheist for 50 years when he came to me, though he had been with me all my life. And uh, he's been um, with me for 13 years now, getting me ready for this. I'll give you an example of what we're talking about. Okay, Malachi 3. God says, I'm sending my messenger before me to clear the way for me and I shall return to my temple suddenly. The angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. That's verse 1. Well, that's the new covenant. That's the covenant you desire. There's only two. The other is the covenant of friendship that I mentioned earlier. There's two parts to that, by the way. There's another part. There's only one covenant. It has to be the new covenant of Jeremiah. This, by the way, is an amendment, but that's a whole other discussion. It's, it's not new. You know, you, the Jewish people have always been his people, and he has always been the God of the Jewish people. There's been no lapses in time. <laughs> he makes an amendment to it, and he adds sin forgiveness, as he did for the, uh, the exiles of Assyria, Babylon, 
on their return, and they became a holy seed, and they built the second temple. In the day of the Lord, he comes again with another covenant that, by the way, has to be delivered by a Moses. He delivered the first covenant. Well, God comes, he's got to have, a, he's got to have another Moses. And so what did he do? He gave us a description. It's called Isaiah 53. Moses was righteous. He was a servant. The man's called my righteous servant. It has a lot of meaning. But here's what Rashi had to say about it. In his commentary that you can find at Shabbat.org. Behold, I send my angel and he will clear the way before me. That should have been the messenger. It's a, I, I can't imagine an organization like Shabbat using such an interpretation. Uh, I don't know where they get their, uh, their translated Hebrew Bible or if they translate it themselves. I'm not sure. And suddenly, the Lord whom you seek will come to his temple. And behold, the angel of the covenant, whom you desire, is coming, says the Lord of hosts. That's Malachi 3.1. Rashi's commentary. And the angel of the covenant. He's just going to comment on that one part of the verse. Who, of, <coughs> who avenges the revenge of the covenant. This is commentary. Nothing about Jeremiah 31. Nothing about a new covenant. Nothing about sin and forgiveness. And I have no idea where you would find. I don't even know how you avenge a revenge of the covenant. I'm not, I have no idea what he's talking about. Somebody can explain that to me. Here's what I think it is. Rashi's interpretation is that the covenant of the angel had been revenged and the angel avenges that revenge. Again, the covenant is not described, nor is there an explanation how this covenant was revenged or how the angel avenges it. You, you can't just go with what they say. I mean, you've got to look at it again today. And you've got to... You got to back into the sages and the town. You can't just say, oh, God's going to come down and make a special heaven for us because we've been through so much. But it can't be done. I'm Moshiach. How am I going to get the world speak Hebrew? One third of the population of the earth in China. There are billions and billions of Chinese. If I take off and go to China, an attempt to get everybody to speak Hebrew. Number one, I don't speak Hebrew yet. And two, I sure don't speak Chinese. Y'all never see me again. I'll never make it to Israel. Much less making the nations love each other. When things are impossible, then you have to look, what else is God doing? He's got other purposes. It's a great story. It's fun. It's poetry. It's pose. Uh, it was for antiquity first, a people of illiteracy into the dark ages who just loved a good story. They needed to be uplifted. They lived in far harsher times than we did for religious purposes, to actually form religion, beliefs in religion. Um, uh, for prophecy that can occur, and just for a good story for the, <clears throat> for the greatest book ever written. The Hebrew Bible. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 23, Behold, I am sending you Elihu, Elijah. This is, this is from a, a writing on Rambam. Uh, one of his chapters in uh, King Moshe. Before the advent of the great and awesome day of God, Rambam says, He will not come in order to declare the pure impure, nor to declare the impure pure. Nor will he come in order to disqualify the lineage of those presumed to be of flawless descent nor to validate lineage which is presumed to be blemished. Rather, 
And again, this is Rambam. He will come in order to establish peace in the world. Elijah does not come to establish peace in the world, but to make the many righteous by his knowledge in recounseling the sons to the fathers and fathers to the son. The family, family members one to the other by bringing them back to Judaism, hence righteousness. Being mindful, this is the amendment to the covenant. Instead of strict compliance with everything Moses told the Israelites who had to agree to a man, this is for those who heed and revere and esteem the name of the Lord. God recognizes with the covenant in hand that even though it says it's going to write toil in your heart and all will heed me, he's making it clear. I know everybody's not going to heed me. They should if I forgive their sins, but there's the reality of it on the last page where I speak to my prophets. Being mindful of teachings God gave Moses at Orb and to the practice of Judaism, he is also to be a messenger of the new covenant with sin forgiveness. Why the name Elijah? He is the only man specifically taken to heaven in the Hebrew Bible. Specifically, the chariots of God. And he is sent back. He returns. Now, obviously, he's going to be a man alive today. It's not going to be the original Elijah. But what is, so what does it mean? Well, figuratively, it means he can talk to the angel who has the covenant. He's been in heaven all this time. And the other thing is a proof. You want to find Elijah, you find the man who can tell you more about heaven, the creation of angels, the Holy Spirit, what heaven is like, what the entertainment will be like in heaven. That's who you find. And But what else? We don't have a description of him other than what things he says. Prophet like Moses, no description. Descendant of King David, no description. We have one description of God's righteous servant. Well, they all, it, it, it's implied, it's implicit, it's explicit. They all are described as righteous and servants of God. In other words, the man who is described in this world today as God's righteous servant, which is me, I fit every verse. The only man to fit every verse. Jesus Christ most certainly did not. He's not even in the conversation, in my opinion. It's certainly not the Israel people. I mean, the Jewish people is the man Israel. I have other videos on that already. There will be more. No, it's the righteous servant. And over 13 years in God's fire of refinement, which includes wounding, punishment, chastisement, maltreatment, bruising, and crushing. Just as it was done to Ezekiel. Ezekiel is the key to Isaiah 53. He goes through everything except wounding and being crushed with disease. That's the only thing that's missing. Other than that, he goes through the same process. And just like with David, a spirit, uh, God was speaking to Ezekiel. He says, at that moment, a spirit entered me. Well, that's, the, that's the spirit of God. And I could hear God speak. God is in his spirit. He's in his angel. The angel of the Lord and the Holy Spirit are the same person. I have videos on that. Chapter 12, paragraph 3 of the laws concerning King Moshiach by Rambam. During the era of the King Moshiach, once his kingdom has been established and all of Israel has gathered around him, the entire nation's line of descent will be established on the basis of his words through the prophetic spirit which will rest upon him. As it is written, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier. He will purify the lineage of the Levites first, stating that this one is a priest of the fine lineage, and this one is a Levite, Levite of the fine lineage. He shall sit as a refiner and purify from this first paragraph of chapter 12, paragraph 3. 
is not Moshe. God purifies and refines, and he comes with Elijah and the angel of the covenant. Rambam says the prophetic spirit will rest upon the anointed one. The prophecy of the Hebrew Bible are the prophecies of God. David does not have a prophetic spirit. No man does. No spirit does. While prophetic spirits were a common belief in the ancient age and middle ages, that is not true for the ages of reasoning and information. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 defines the attributes of the spirit that does alight upon the anointed one as a spirit of wisdom and insight, a spirit of counsel and valor, a spirit of devotion and reverence for the Lord. So these are attributes of a spirit. One that's understandable in antiquity. They believe in these kind of things. Prophetic spirits. A spirit, he will be so wise, he must have a wise spirit on him. That's not the Holy Spirit of God who entered upon and entered me and God was in him. He is a person which Judaism does not even recognize, which I find fascinating because there's just too many references to it. He's clearly a person. There's no denying it. And, of course, I know him personally and have for 13 years. Now, he, they entered me in the first year of my life. They came to me. They came to Jeremiah, they say, in the womb. And just to make sure he was a godly, priestly man. God had plans for that baby. He came to me in my first year in the womb for a whole other, whole other purpose. To make sure I lived a life of suffering, familiar with disease, and to fit every single verse. Once you know how to interpret them, and I do, because he told me, every single verse to be his righteous servant. But he did not speak to me until I was 50 years old. As I mentioned, I was an atheist until I was 50. That's when it changed. I have a video coming out on that chapter in my book that he dictated to me, and I typed, the life of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. It's my life. It shows you how I fit into these verses. You know, it's not everything I ever did in my life. It's not that kind of autobiography, but it's, uh, it focuses in on injuries. You know, being gunshot, just about losing my right leg. Uh, surgeries where I'm opened up over and over again, things like that. It's, it's pretty easy, fast read, but it's focused on Isaiah 53. So anyway, there's no prophetic spirit, and this purifier is God. Uh, I don't know if I get more to it in my notes here, or but I know for sure there's more on it in the book. This is from Rambam. Is, is, uh, this chapter is in uh, Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord. And God dictated it to me. So then we have this. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can hold out when he appears? For he is like a smelter's fire and fuller's lie. He shall act like a smelter and purger of silver. And he shall purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. So they shall present offerings in righteousness. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of yore and in the years of old. But first, I will step forward to contend against you and I will act as a relentless, relentless accuser against those who have no fear of me. Rabbis. That's what he's talking about. This is God. This is not Moshe. He's the smells of fire. That's Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. This is God, not David or Elijah. In Hebrew writing, it is common to express the same idea twice using two different phrasings or metaphors. For he is like a smelter's fire and like fuller's lie is a good example. Fuller's lie, soap, should be understood the long along the lines of smelter's fire. Someone would bring a lump of gold or silver and the smelter would use fire to burn off the dross and purify the precious metal. Similarly, people would bring their wool to the fuller and he would use soap to clean the wool and remove the impurities so that what is left is pure wool. 
in Malachi 1 and 2, the priesthood, chapters 1 and 2, before, before chapter 3, the priesthood has been defiled. They offer polluted offerings. They have turned from God and refused to listen to Him, and they profane God's covenant. They disregard God's ways. Those who have no fear of me would be the priestly tribe of the Levites and not pertain to genealogy or tribal lineage, but to Ezekiel 34. Thus said the Lord God, I'm going to deal with the shepherds. I will demand a reckoning of them from my flock, and I will dismiss them from tending the flock. Now that would have been an interpretation for antiquity in the Middle Ages. Today, it's the rabbis. Doesn't have to be the priestly tribe of the Levites. There's no purity in the 12 tribes anymore. You can't separate them out. Malachi chapter 3, verse 3 says that He shall purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they shall print, present offerings in righteousness. I just went over. This is those rabbis who accept, those who are purified, who accept the words of the prophets of God as interpreted in this day of reasoning and information and not as interpreted in antiquity in the Middle Ages. The era of redemption, restoration, and exalting verses, <coughs> the verses, the day of the Lord. The Rambam and the sages interpreted as prophecy that Moshiach with a prophetic spirit, would determine the lineage of the priests and Levites from a verse in the book of Ezra. And everybody can find that themselves. It's uh, chapter 2, verse 63. This has nothing to do with genealogy of Levites today or purification or refining of a prophetic spirit on Moshiach. This is not a prophecy of a high priest arising. It is not Moshiach but an answer to those who could not prove they were Levites when the verse was put into proper context. This, this video is about that reckoning because they just refuse to recognize it. I don't know the reasons. I know that they, it's part of the 13 fundamental principles of Judaism of Rambam that uh, is preyed on uh, weekly by the Orthodox Jews, including a belief in the resurrection of the dead that occurs when Moshiach is here. That's billions of people. That's billions of people who have nothing and no place to go and nothing to eat. It would destroy the Israeli government. It, you know, when you see a prophecy like that, that's fine for the people of antiquity because that's what they believed in. They didn't even really uh, have a special belief in spiritual heaven. They just wanted their dead ones to come back, and that's the best thing they could think of. Just come back. Come out of the ground and be with me again. But that's why God sends one last prophet to tell him, as he told Moses, he's with me as he was with Moses. It's the same thing. It's how he was with all his prophets. I'm a man in divine beings. Now Jacob wrestled, he tells us, I wrestle with a man in divine beings. Judaism says that's an angel. No, it's a man in divine beings. What does that mean? The Spirit of God entered me and God is in His Spirit. That's two persons. That's two beings. And they're divine. And they're divine. And He just tells me what to do. It doesn't make me an angel. I don't have special power. You know, they tell me, you still have to live the human experience. Just because we're here, there's no special perks for you. You're a servant. And... Um, we're going to train you up for this, and I'll tell you, it hasn't been none too kind of a training. I just soon trained to be a Green Beret, Navy SEAL, <laughs> or to climb Mount Everest. It goes to what they put me through. But primarily God, he's the one with the power. 
Anyway, thank you for listening to this video. Uh, there's going to be plenty more. If there's anything I was discussing, you can always find my books at my uh, uh, webpage, which is Keith McCarty, McCarty wordpress.com both books are there and there's a lot of other things but you'll find those in a, the first first three writing they're blog writing you'll find the books there one's about 285 pages the other's about 181 and everything I ever talk about is coming from those two books unpublished to date but I'll, we'll get that taken care of thank you very much have a good day